Janine Pontybega grew up in New Jersey. Uh, when she was 16 years old, she read, uh, in 1958, she read On the Road, and it changed her life. Um, she decided she didn't want the uh, traditional life that had been uh, waiting her there in high school in New Jersey. She wanted the excitement of meeting the Beats and living like they were living. So at 16 years old, she went to New York City, and she runs into Gregory Corso, uh, who seduces her and then introduces her to his friends, uh, Allen Ginsberg and Peter Orlovsky. And uh, she and Peter fell in love, and she moved in with Peter and Alan, and Alan was just about to leave for South America at that time. Uh, and so she and Peter basically lived together for several months, on the, I guess it was on the Lower East Side, uh, became very close. Also, she, you know, she's still going to high school. She's going back and forth to New Jersey to high school and trying to, to live this life in, in Manhattan. Um, starting to get into drugs already because the whole beat scene, as we will we'll hear again and again, was heavily imbued with drugs. Um, and, and um, you know, is having an almost a schizophrenic life between New Jersey and, and her parents. But she managed to finish high school. But what happened was she was very much in love with Peter. Um, it was it was a great blossoming romance, Peter Arlovsky, and then Alan comes back from South America, and Alan says, "Okay, Peter and I are going to India. Bye bye." And uh, Peter, being dutiful also to Alan, uh, they left for India for several years, and she was left high and dry, uh, shocked, uh, really traumatized by that, at a very young age, 17 or 18 years old now. Um, met Herbert Hunky, who took her under his wing, the famed junkie of the Beat Generation. Uh, Hunky was a great support to her, uh, really helped her, uh, encouraged her in her writing. Uh, the only problem was, of course, Hunky was one of the great heroin junkies of all time. And so uh, he really got her hooked on heroin, um, which was, a, was a, a troublesome thing in and, in and out of her life for a long time. Um, but at one point, she met the Peruvian painter, uh, uh, Fernando Vega, uh, her name was Janine Pommy, her, her original name, and uh, she married this Peruvian painter, uh, Fernando Vega, and they traveled through uh, Europe and uh, I guess North Africa together, uh, and that was a major changing event. He was an artist, a tremendous artist, um, it was in taking her out of America, you know, to, to North Africa, to Paris. That was, a, again, a major thing for her. Um, and then another traumatic, her life was, was a series of traumas because uh, he was also a junkie. Um, they were out of heroin and he sent her to Paris. He said, we need to get us some more heroin. We need heroin. So I think he was on, they were on an island or they were in North Africa. I can't remember exactly where. Um, but anyway, she goes to Paris and she mails him a package of heroin. And he takes too much of it and he overdoses and dies. Uh, so she's got this guilt for the rest of her life that she sent him the heroin that he died on. Uh, and she uh, was hugely traumatized but came out of it again through writing and wrote a series of, of poems called Poems to Fernando, which was her first book, which was published by City Lights. And I'm going to just condensing a lot because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, but she, she literally lived on the streets for about a year and a half. I mean, literally lived on the streets, traveled the country in a, in a, in a car, read her poems out of her car to pay for meals, uh, got to San Francisco, met Lawrence Ferlinghetti, met some of the poets out here, and that's where the, uh, the publishing contract came, uh, and she became known for this first book. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to condense a lot of it. But she had an amazing life and, and very troubled life until um, uh, later, later in her life. And, and her life was marked by heavy debts of her father and her mother. Uh, but her mother left her $5,000 uh, in about whenever, I don't know, 1970 or in the late 60s. And in those days, you could still buy a house in like, she'd gone to Woodstock because she was a, a girlfriend at one point of LeVon Helm. And uh, she discovered Woodstock, and her mother left her $5,000, and she was able to buy a farmhouse in, in Woodstock for $5,000. Uh, it didn't have, it had no indoor plumbing, and it had one, one wood burning stove, but she had a place to live. And that, again, transformed her life, uh, because she went from the life of somebody who had been a street person and a junkie with no place to live, she had a home. And she, she nourished that home, and she, she put an indoor toilet in, and it became, it became her home for the rest of her life. Uh, and her poetry changed, and her poetry really began to incorporate nature. And, I mean, I visited her there, and I stayed with her in that farmhouse, and she used to love to sit out on the veranda at night because the stars were so clear. I don't know if Woodstock is still like that. It actually was outside of Woodstock. It's a little town called Willow. 
Um, and the stars were so clear, you could see every star in the sky. And she learned all of the stars, because when I was visiting her there, she could tell me every one single one of the constellations. And the stars of nature began to enter her poetry uh, and balance this pain that she had known. Uh, and she herself became, I think, a great healer. She, she began a career which was her career for the rest of her life as a poet in the schools in New York, and also a poet in the prisons. And she would visit the prisoners and teach them poetry, and use poetry as a means of healing them. Um, and her poetry just got deeper and deeper and more profound. Um, she, I, unfortunately, her health went down because, uh, which happens to a lot of people that use needles, she had hep C, uh, which destroyed her liver, and eventually she died of that. As you can see, we don't have a picture of her because when she was young, she was absolutely gorgeous, very beautiful, blonde. I gave him a younger picture, but this, is, this was the, the hep C ravaged Janine at the end of her life. Uh, but still a great force, a great power, wonderful letter writer, wonderful performer of her poetry. I'm going to read a, a, a quick poem of hers and, and we'll move this show along. But this is a, all of her poetry is just very profound. If you haven't read Janine Palmy Vega, I encourage you to go uh, and find her work. This is called Leaving Town in a Hurry. I'm a dreamer. Better say I am precipitous with longing. Better say a face sees nothing in the night but what it looks for. Herdsmen, out of the reach of clouds, your crown held lofty and aloof from the perimeters. Southern, she's looking at the stars. Southern cross, the lands I head toward, lonely and unfathomable. I would like eyes to greet me here on the plains of sleep. I would like waking up with a green-eyed man making cornbread eggs and coffee. <laughs> what I would and where I go are separate necessities. Riding an unknown wave in the dark, I turn back and see my heart in a carriage driving the other way. Stars in the midnight alley, stars at the perimeter. I walk the downtown tenderloin of Honolulu, tattoo parlors gravitating toward telephone booths, a bare light bulb in the distance, seeing Scorpius on the horizon. I must be one step away from sanity, one step off from the cause of things, one step from an unholy chaos, leaning toward an eye behind me, picked from all the multitude of eyes to lean toward. Crazy. I must be crazy. Thank you.